Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. To our parents, grandparents, and possibly even great-grandparents, Churchill was the greatest man of his age and a patriot par excellence. There were lots of stories about men doing things with guards in the 50s. There's one about Churchill who was woken up by his PPA when he was prime minister in the 50s and told, there's a bit of a scandal, prime minister. There's one of our backbench MPs who was found with a guardsman in St. James's Park in the bushes last night by the police, and the papers have got hold of it. Churchill said, last night, his PPA said, yes. Churchill said, it was very cold last night. To which his PPA said, well, yes, I believe it was one of the coldest February nights for 30 years. Churchill said, it makes you proud to be British. <laughs> Um, before I tell you about tonight's session, I would like to welcome um, Sir Ben Helfgott, who was knighted in the Queen's Birthday Honours this summer. Would you like to stand up? Um, <laughs> he, as a Holocaust survivor, knows more than anyone else in this hall what would have befallen him if Churchill had not been our inspirational war leader. It was he who, after liberation from the concentration camps, said that the story of what has happened to him and his family and to the six million Jews murdered by the Nazis must be told. He is an inspiration to us all. <laughs> and now to tonight's event. Churchill said, history, history will be kind to me, for I intend to write it. Well, you must judge for yourself whether he was right, since there have been 1,009 biographies written about Churchill, possibly the best known one that written by Roy Jenkins in 2001, and in the context of tonight's session, that by Martin Gilbert, Churchill and the Jews, A Lifelong Friendship, published in 2007. Professor Andrew Roberts' book, Churchill, Walking with Destiny, which has now entered the top 10 list of Sunday Times bestsellers, is unique in that he had available over 40 collections not available to Roy Jenkins and is the first Churchill biographer to be granted access by the Queen to the private diaries of King George VI. Our speaker tonight, Richard Cohen, was involved in the research and proofreading of the book. He's a district councillor in Epping and former chairman and senior warden of Loughton Synagogue. He was called to the bar in Middle Temple in 1977, and from 1984, he has had a career as a solicitor. I know Richard as a fellow deputy at the Board of Deputies. Tonight, Richard is going to take us through the areas of Jewish interest to our community, and we'll have available signed copies of Professor Robert's book for you to purchase after the talk. Um, a very good evening to everybody. Um, it's funny how you get found out in life because the last person that came up to me just said, I didn't realize you're a historian. So um, if you Google me, you won't find a list of 20 books that I've written or you'll see that I've been at university getting a double first. Um, the thing about being a historian is, is that you don't actually have to go to university to be a historian. Um, Churchill himself went to Harrow, which meant that uh, he had to be an, an autodidact so when he, when he was in India, that's where he read up most of his history, Macaulay and Gibbon. Um, I first met Andrew Roberts, who wrote this book in front of me, at the House of Commons a couple of years ago. It was a Balfour lecture, and he spoke up extremely passionately for Israel. And he's written articles about the Balfour Declaration. Um, he was also an ardent advocate of the royal visit to Israel. And he set up a, an organization called the uh, Friends of Israel Initiative, which he, together with um, Stephen Harper, who was the previous uh, Prime Minister of Canada, Senior Astonar of Spain, and Colonel Richard Kemp, all of whom you've probably heard, uh, they advocate for Israel and they say things, because they're all non-Jewish, that we Jews probably would be quite nervous in, in advocating ourselves. For instance, recently they advocated that the Golan Heights should be uh, annexed to Israel. I don't think that's something that the Board of Deputies would feel strong enough to do. So I, I, I spoke to him that evening, and I, because of his uh, ardent friendship with the Jewish people and with Israel and his love of Churchill, um, I struck up a bond with him, and we've been in contact over the last two years. 
Um, it's certainly been a lot more interesting than residential conveyancing. Uh, I, I have visited some interesting places, the Morpeth Mansions where Churchill lived, and have obviously in, investigated the uh, Hansard and various sources to, to dig up some nuggets about Churchill. But I feel that I owe you a further explanation this evening because you, you're probably wondering who that why that chap Disraeli is up there because he certainly doesn't look like Winston Churchill. He looks a bit too Jewish. But I think if we're going to delve back into history and uh, you'll know, or if Churchill lived to 90, that he was actually born in 1874, which was the first year that Disraeli formed his major administration. And if you want to know why Churchill was a philo-Semite, you, you really have to look at his father, Lord Randolph Churchill, who was on very familiar terms with Disraeli. He was too young to be a minister, but was a close confidant of Disraeli. Um, and between Disraeli and Randolph Churchill, they formulated this idea of Tory democracy, which involves the aristocracy feeling a sense of obligation to the working class. So it was the Tories at the time who, brought, who extended the franchise to the working man, and they brought in a lot of legislation involving slum clearance and uh, anti, uh, uh, as far as the chimneys were concerned, this, uh, the kids that used to go up the chimneys, they, they brought in protective legislation. And this was something that was carried on by Winston Churchill because he was a liberal member of parliament for a time and he brought in a lot of legislation for widows pensions, um, shop, shop workers relief uh, so that they could have half a day off work. Um, and this was something that throughout his life he owed to Disraeli. And like Churchill, um, Disraeli uh, was quite wont to come up with certain epigrams that, that Churchill found quite inspiring. When Disraeli made his maiden speech in 1837, he was shouted down, and his finishing words to his speech were, though I sit down now, the time will come when you will hear me. And if you can think about Churchill being in the wilderness during the 1930s, when nobody was listening to him about the threat of Hitler, uh, those words were very inspiring to him. Other words that he found inspiring was that uh, you should aim high in life because you will never achieve more than your ambitions. So I've got a few pictures here of Disraeli, which I'm going to uh, run through. And then that's Disraeli with Queen Victoria. Um, she was actually a bit of an anti-Semite, Queen Victoria, and she, the first meeting they had, she asked him, uh, Mr. Disraeli, are you a Christian or a Jew? He said, ma'am, I am the blank page between the Old and the New Testaments. And as far as Churchill is concerned, he wrote six million words, but he never once mentioned the name Jesus Christ. He was a believer in God and in the Almighty, but he wasn't what you would call a conventional Christian. Um, he described himself as not being a pillar of the church, but more of a flying buttress from the outside. And I often wondered whether he um, would con consider converting to Judaism because he wrote a monogram about Moses and said that everything that you read in the Bible about Moses is true. But I think he was too wedded to his love of Ham followed by Stilton, so that probably would have put him out of court to, uh, to become a Jew. Uh, but of course, he would never have been prime minister anyway. Such was the anti-Semitic climate at the time. Anyway, Churchill's parents, uh, his mother, if you look at the internet, you'll see all the conspiracy theorists say that she was, because she's from America, from New York, therefore she was of Jewish stock. But this is in fact completely untrue. She came from a family called the Jeromes. Uh, they were a very wealthy New York family, but far from having any Jewish blood in their veins, if there was any foreign blood at all, it would have been a little bit of Red Indian. In fact, she was not a philo -Semite. In Churchill's very early years, uh, he would upbraid his mother for, for making uh, anti-Semitic remarks. But I suppose that there was one respect in which she did behave a bit like a Jewish mother because she was very fiercely involved in his advancement. Uh, Churchill's father died when Churchill was 20, 
and uh, that was in 1895. Strangely enough, um, when he died in 1895, on January the 24th, he, he preceded his son by exactly 70 years on the same day, and Churchill actually predicted that he would die on, on the 24th of January 1960, well, not 1965, but the same, the same day as his father. But coming back to um, Jenny, um, she, it was said of her that she would leave no stone unturned, no cutlet uncooked in, in pursuit of her son's interest. In fact, there's a book that's just been published of the letters between them, which really read more like a brother and sister than a, a mother and a son, which is strange, actually, because when during Churchill's formative years, um, his parents treated him very badly. I mean, they, they, as most aristocratic families did in those days, they uh, sent him off to boarding school and pretty well left him to get on with it. Um, and he had a very ha unhappy childhood. He was always writing them letters, bequesting them, begging them to come and visit him more. Um, which they rarely did. Um, and his father was actually even worse because he had always had a very low opinion of Winston. He thought that he was lazy, uh, he didn't apply himself, and that uh, basically he would lead a life of a social wastrel. Um, he failed his exams, Winston, when he tried to get into Sandhurst, and he only passed on the third attempt. And because he didn't come in the, in the top third, uh, he went into the cavalry instead of the infantry, and his father took a very dim view of that. So he never really had a close relationship with him at all. In fact, once when Churchill wanted to, when Randolph Churchill was a minister and Winston wanted to help him out with his work, sort out some papers from him, he said his father throws him into stone. And yet everything that Churchill did after that was an attempt to please his father um, and to show him that Churchill really could make something of himself. When Churchill was in opposition in the 19, after the 1945 election, he wrote an article called The Dream in which he was in his studio painting and he thought that he saw his father sitting in a chair and had a vision of him and Randolph was asking questions about about what Churchill had done. Um, it's an interesting essay because Churchill never actually tells him that uh, he kind of helped to save the United Kingdom and the British Empire in the Second World War. So it was a really a relationship that's worthy of psychoanalysis. Uh, once his Churchill's daughter Mary said to him, if there was anybody that you would like to be able to bring back now to sit in a seat and, and chat with them, who would it be? Um, you might have thought it would be one of Churchill's heroes, the Duke of Marlborough or Napoleon. In fact, he said he wanted, without hesitation, to see his father Randolph again. So Lord Randolph Churchill, mixed in Jewish circles with such well-known families as the Castles and the Rothschilds, um, it, to such an extent that he once went to a party in Buckinghamshire and the host said to him, I see, Lord Randolph, that you've not brought your Jewish friends with you. And Randolph replied, no, I thought they'd be rather bored in this company. Um, and this philo-Semitism was something that Churchill picked up and ran with. Um, when he was 21, he was an ardent supporter of uh, Captain Dreyfus in the Dreyfus Affair in France. And then eventually, when he became an MP, he, um, that's Churchill as a boy at Harrow, he had, a, he had remarkable gifts of prophecy, Churchill. When he was 16, he told a friend of his called Merlin Evans that um, he foresaw uh, great events befalling London, Britain, and the empire. London will be in great danger. This is in 1891. And Churchill said that I will be called upon to defend London. And I think these prophecies that Churchill made it's one of the reasons why Andrew Roberts calls his book Walking with Destiny. Um, it seems that Churchill always thought that he was destined to be prime minister. Um, and it is remarkable that it's as if there were invisible wings at many stages in his life when 
he could have been killed. I mean, obviously he went into the army. So he, he was the part of the uh, last charge at Omdurman. Uh, he was in India and South Africa when he was imprisoned. He had numerous accidents. He was stabbed at school. Um, and he was run over several times. He had air crashes, all sorts of things. Um, but he always believed in his own star. And a further example of his prophecies was that he wrote an essay in 1931 in which he predicted the mobile phone. He predicted that the, uh, uh, the atom bomb could be created the size of an orange. Um, he also even wrote, and this is something that I saw in the newspaper the other day, that it would be possible to create a chicken in a laboratory for, by culturing chicken feathers. And this is actually being done now. So it's not just on... It's not just his ability as a historian, but he was also very interested in science as well, though he wasn't a scientist. Um, he partnered with um, Lindemann in, in World War II, who was obviously of German extraction, and uh, his interest in science obviously helped to uh, create uh, weapons and ways of dealing with the enemy that before radar, of course, that before the Germans got to it. But the most important thing, of course, was, was the bomb. Churchill had a brother called Jack, who he got on very well with. Uh, that's Churchill at the end of life revisiting Harrow. I said before that he was at Harrow School. I mean, it, it is remarkable that the man in his 80s should have such uh, acclamation as he did from young, young people at that age. So Churchill became an MP when he came back from South Africa, uh, initially for Oldham as a conservative, but because he was a free trader, um, he went over to the Liberal Party, and he was MP in Manchester, and they had a very big Jewish electorate, maybe as much as a third, um, and he adopted a lot of Jewish causes. Uh, the first major one was the Aliens Act, because, of course, a lot of Jews were escaping from the pogroms in Russia, and they came over to the UK in large numbers, and um, this caused quite a lot of unrest amongst the population, fearing for their jobs, fearing for the identity of, of East London. And it was the Conservatives who originally brought in the bill. And Churchill made some um, pretty rousing speeches against the bill. And actually, the bill was abandoned by the Tories, only to be retaken up again by the Liberal Party, but in, in a more sort of watered-down way. It's probably very dif difficult for us to comprehend that 100 years ago, when one became an MP, you, not only weren't you paid, but you're expected to make charitable donations within your constituency. So Churchill was a donor to um, the Talmud Torah schools, and various Jewish hospitals, and he built up a very close relationship with his constituents, and he, and he met people like uh, Weizmann and Rabbi Gaster, who educated him about Zionism. So his knowledge of Zionism was planted whilst he was a, an MP in Manchester. And he, he actually had quite a lot of attributes that made him unpopular. I, I suppose because he was half American, there was a particular um, editor of a magazine of the, called the National Review called Leo Maxi, who described Churchill as being half American and totally unacceptable. I think it wasn't just anti-Semitism in those days, but there was a great xenophobia within the House of Commons and within the public at large. And Churchill was always an outsider. He always relished a fight, so that the more that people would uh, criticize him for his friendship with the Jews, the more he regarded it as a kind of a challenge. Um, he did actually have quite a lot of Jewish characteristics, um, ambition, pushiness, bravado, but he also had an element of chutzpah. Uh, when he was um, run over in 1931, when he was meeting Bernard Baruch in New York, remember at the time in 1931 there was prohibition in America and uh, alcohol was forbidden. He was uh, confined to the Lenox Hill Hospital in New York City after the accident, and he asked the attending physician, Dr. Otto Pickhart, sounds like something out of Marx Brothers, of whom he was a great fan, to write the following note, which he knew would be 
something that an year of prohibition would, would exhibit a great deal of chutzpah. This is to certify that the post-accident convalescence of the Honourable Winston S. Churchill necessitates the use of alcoholic spirits, especially at mealtimes. The quantity is naturally indefinite, but the minimum requirements would be 250 cubic centimetres. So there's quite a lot of chutzpah involved in uh, getting the doctor to do that. So his career progressed and he became Home Secretary in 1911. And he had to deal with quite a lot of industrial unrest. There were riots in Tony Pandy in Wales uh, against Jewish landlords and it looked as though there was going to be some serious uh, injuries caused and Churchill sent in the, the troops to protect the Jews. And um, that's just one, another example of, of his philo-Semitism. And then in the First World War, as you know, he, he became First Lord of the Admiralty. Um, now, as Churchill lived for 90 years, and I've only got 45 minutes, um, I can't go through every year because that's, that would be only about two minutes a year. But um, what, what I would say about Churchill in the First World War was that he became friends and closely, close associate again of Chaim Weizmann because Chaim Weizmann was a chemist and um, he used acetone as, to be built, made in a laboratory as part of the uh, use of cordite, which was used for explosives. And Weizmann was able to make acetone in great quantities and this earned the undying gratitude of Churchill um, and was probably one of the reasons why the cabinet passed the Balfour Declaration. There's a lot of reasons why the Balfour Declaration was passed and Churchill was actually not part of the war cabinet at the time because after he was first Lord of the Admiralty there was a disastrous mission to uh, go through the Dardanelles in order to capture Constantinople to try and take Turkey out of the war to reduce the carnage on the Western Front. But that was a, that was a failure and um, Churchill was out of government which meant that he didn't, he wasn't actually one of the drafters of the Balfour Declaration but he did support it. And his time came in 1920 when he was made colonial secretary and he was posted to Palestine and it was his job to really to find out what was going on there and whether it would be possible to implement the Balfour Declaration. Churchill always felt that this declaration was possible to fulfill. I think nowadays people feel that it was an impossible declaration because it made too many promises to different people that couldn't be reconciled. But Churchill said that these obligations that were made by the British government couldn't just be thrown away. And, and another reason that he was very keen on the Balfour Declaration at the time that it was made was that they wanted to bring in American Jewry uh, into the First World War to try to get to encourage America to, to join in the war, pretty much like in the, as in the Second World War, he needed to do this as well. And, um, he also was rather hoping that uh, if he could persuade Jews in Russia to be more Zionistic than they were communists, that perhaps the Russians would remain in, 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 as part of the Allies. But this didn't in fact happen. Uh, Churchill hated communism and he, he regarded Bolshevism as a foul baboonery and did, did what he could to try to um, get the white Russians to get back into power in the early 1920s, but, but that failed. The thing about Churchill, though, was that he was adaptable, and much as he hated communism, as we'll see in a little while, he, he knew eventually that uh, they would have to ally with the communists against Nazi Germany, but unfortunately, Chamberlain and, and the rest of them didn't go along with this, so he failed there. But of course, as, you, as we all know, in, in World War II, he had to make common calls with Stalin in fact, when, when Russia did, did come into the war, uh, Churchill said that uh, if Hitler invaded hell, I would have a good word to say about the devil. So 
you know, obviously the friend of my friend is, my, is not my enemy. So, coming back to Palestine again, he, um, he was extremely impressed with the efforts that the uh, Jewish pioneers were making in terms of uh, making the deserts bloom, in terms of providing employment to not just the Jews out there in, his, in Palestine, but the Arabs as well. And Churchill always thought that uh, the creation of a Jewish state within Palestine would be a blessing not only for the Jews, but for the Arabs and the rest of the world as well. Um, so I, I feel that, um, having met Andrew Roberts, that this is something that we all have an obligation, perhaps to the memory of Churchill, to try to pursue. But I think I'm probably going a little bit ahead of myself because you've got the poster at the moment behind me, which is a recruiting poster from the First World War. It's a Canadian recruiting poster, but it's got at the top there three gentlemen who did play prominent roles in the British government. And as this talk is about Churchill and the Jews, I thought I ought to say a little bit about Jews that played a prominent role in those years. So on the left, we have Herbert Samuel, who became the first High Commissioner in Israel. But he also was played very prominent roles as a minister in the Liberal government and in the coalition government after the First World War. Um, but the strange thing about Herbert Samuel, which would be might come as a surprise, is that he was also an appeaser during the 1930s. You would have thought that uh, Jewish MPs would automatically be uh, anti-Hitler, anti but that isn't actually the case when you, when you pursue it a little bit further. Gentleman in the middle is Viscount Redding. He was, known, he was also, prior to that, known called Rufus Isaacs. Uh, he became Chief Justice, and he was also a Viceroy in India. Um, he was involved in a little bit of a scandal called the Marconi scandal, which I won't go into um, very much, but Churchill did defend him and Lloyd George in that. There was quite a lot of corruption <laughs> around Lloyd George, um, and even though Churchill was his colleague for many years, uh, it didn't always do him an enormous amount of good being too closely associated with Lloyd George. An interesting sideline um, to Lord Reading is that any of you that have been to Tel Aviv would probably be aware that there's a power station there called the Reading Power Station, which isn't actually named after the town Reading, but it's named after the gentleman in the middle. Gentleman on the right is called Edwin Montague. He's an interesting character because um, Herbert Asquith, who was Prime Minister before Lloyd George, um, instead of uh, in cabinet meetings, taking notes and being in command of the, the cabinet meetings, was often writing love letters to his, his uh, mistress, Phoenicia Stanley. But um, he was rather miffed, was old Has Asquith, when Edmund Montague um, actually married this Phoenicia Stanley, and uh, she actually converted to Judaism. But his role, he was, he was also a Secretary of State for India, and during his tenure, there was uh, something called the Amritsar Massacre. Now, when, you, when you're writing a book about Churchill, as Andrew Roberts has done, you, he's often assailed with people saying, you know, a bit like when people shout at you, free Palestine, when you're walking to shore. People shout at Andrew Roberts, what about the Bengal famine? What about Dresden? What about Churchill's racist views? So, you know, there's always things being thrown at him. Um, as far as uh, Montague was concerned, he, his role as the Secretary of State for India was to bring General Dyer down a few pegs to um, demote him because there'd been a terrible massacre in India, about 600 Indians that didn't have any weapons at the time. They were just demonstrating against uh, the rough treatment they'd received from the British authorities. It was his job in the House of Commons to... Um, justify the Liberal government's uh, attempt to remove this General Dyer. And his attempts, to, his attempts to rebuke General Dyer in the House of Commons were a total disaster. It was because of anti-Semitism. Um, 
the average politician felt that it was no business of a Jew to come in and tell the British how to run their affairs. And in the way that the Americans say that something's un-American, they accused him of being un-English. And the government was actually going to lose the vote. But Winston Churchill came along and he rescued the situation. Um, he criticized General Dyer. And in the end, the Commons voted overwhelmingly to censure General Dyer. One more interesting fact about Edwin Montague is that when the Balfour Declaration was passed, he was the most ardent opponent of the Balfour Declaration because he felt that it would be impugning his loyalty as a British citizen for him to show any kind of loyalty for a, a Jewish state in Palestine. Um, it's not just Edwin Montague, but the Board of Deputies at the time, Ben, I think you'll find, were very anti-Zionist. But of course, we know a lot more now than, than they knew at the time. So after the war, um, Churchill became Chancellor of the Exchequer. He, he ratted, I think, I think he said that to, to leave the Liberal Party, to leave the Conservative Party and then to join the Liberals and to go back to the Conservatives was, was re-ratting. I think this is an example of his uh, supreme self-confidence. Um, he said really that his reason for going back to the Conservatives was is that they were uh, adopting um, free trade again, but they, they zigzagged um, at the time. But Stanley Baldwin, who was Prime Minister from 24 to 29, obviously saw that uh, Churchill uh, was an outstanding performer in the House of Commons, and uh, he promoted him. Um, obviously, when Ch Churchill was Chancellor of the Exchequer, the two things that he's known for, really, is taking Britain back to the gold standard, which he actually didn't want to do. Um, I think it was Keynes who also said that Britain should not go back to the gold standard, but he was persuaded by Montague, Norman and others, and of course Churchill got the blame when the slump arrived. Um, he also got the blame for the general strike as well. Although when the general strike was over, he, um, he did try to uh, get a compromise between the miners and the uh, the, the, coal, the coal mine owners. Um, and the thing about Churchill was is that even when he got his policies wrong, his speeches in the House of Commons always drew uh, myriads of other MPs to come in and, and see how he was getting on. This was Churchill when he was visiting um, President uh, Hoover in America. Um, well, obviously, as Jews, we're all, we all learn, don't we, from the, our liturgy that it's not good for man to be alone. And Churchill had a... a a great marriage with uh, Clementine, and he basically said of his marriage that on a particular day I married Clementine and I lived happily ever after. Um, she was actually much more liberal in outlook than he was, um, and she was often upbraiding him, and she had the power to tell him that um, he was not always treating his staff well during the Second World War because he had a bit of a short fuse, but um, she, she was his rock. That's a... a painting of uh, Clementine, which you'll find at Chartwell, if any of you have been there. Okay, so just jumping back to Palestine again, um, what did Churchill do when he was colonial secretary? Well, he carved out the area of land in green, and he created the state of Jordan, Transjordan, um, in, in the eastern Palestine, um, leaving, as you can see, Western Palestine, which includes Judea and Sumeria. Churchill himself um, always thought that uh, that's that pretty much how Palestine should look as the state of Israel. And um, he was very much opposed to partitioning Palestine more than it was. But um, obviously, he was pretty much alone on that. As far as immigration to Palestine was concerned, he, he always felt that as long as the uh, economic abs absorptive capacity of Palestine was sufficient to uh, incorporate um, Jewish immigrants, uh, that there should be no particular uh, other stopping of, of, of that process. Um, obviously, later on, just before the Second World War, the White Paper was passed, which restricted immigration of, to Palestine to 75,000 over a period of five years. And then after five years, 
uh, it would be up to the Arabs as to whether any further Jewish immigration could take place. And Churchill was vehemently opposed to this, but as we'll see, he never actually reversed that policy um, in, during the Second World War. Yeah, I mean, the thing is, is that there were various commissions in the 1930s, the Woodhead Commission, uh, and then the Peel Commission, and the size of, of the territory allotted to the Jewish state was reduced from 20% of the original uh, mandate down to about 5%. Um, that's Churchill with Herbert Samuel. Right, so we'll leave it there for the moment because the 1930s, um, once uh, the Conservatives lost the election in 1929, Churchill was out of office for 10 years and he didn't do himself much good because he supported unpopular causes such as uh, opposing independence for India and he also supported Edward VIII during the abdication crisis. I think the thing about this book is, is that it shows that uh, although Churchill was absolutely indispensable to the favourable outcome of the war. He made plenty of mistakes and he made plenty of enemies along the way. Um, during the 1930s, he probably only had a hardcore support of about 12 MPs. And um, it's really quite remarkable that um, he, the way in which he managed to, to get back into power again. But his attitude to the Second World War it's what he called the unnecessary war because he felt that if Hitler could have been stopped in his tracks at various times uh, when Hitler marched into Rhineland, when he marched into, into Austria and of course over Czechoslovakia as well, that if the West had shown some more backbone that the Second World War really could have been avoided. Now I said before that um, he hated the Russia, he hated communism with a vengeance. But Churchill realized that if Russia was brought into the picture, they could surround Germany with a ring of steel. And really, the, the one thing that Hitler didn't want, of course, was a, was a war on two fronts. But, you know, Chamberlain was so stubborn that he, he'd had no dealings with Russia at all. And at Munich, when the fate of Czechoslovakia was sealed, Russia wasn't even invited to the conference. And, you know, what do people do when they're spurned? They, get, they go somewhere else. And unfortunately, the, the Russians found it convenient to have this um, marriage of convenience with the Nazis at the time, which made World War II inevitable. Churchill didn't always feel that Hitler was a terrible threat. I mean, at first, a lot of people thought that uh, he was bringing some discipline to Germany through its financial chaos, and that uh, he was a bulwark against communism. In fact, you know, Churchill even attended the, um, the Olympics in Berlin in 1936. So, you know, one thinks that um, Churchill eschewed everything that Hitler did. But, you know, a lot of people like Lloyd George, a lot of British politicians, they did think that uh, fascism, and, and that Churchill was quite a supporter of Mussolini at first as well. But, you know, his eyes were pretty well opened. And I think because Churchill was a philo -Semite, I think he saw that Hitler's persecution of the Jews was simply uh, the canary down the mine and was a precursor of terrible things to come. And the thing about Churchill is that he was always thinking ahead and, you know, not only did he realize that Russia would have to be brought into the circle as well, but of course, America. That, I think that was one of Churchill's greatest achievements uh, when Britain was going it alone, was to um, form this unbreakable friendship with Roosevelt. Um, you know, numerous letters backwards and forwards Churchill was always flying over to America to, to stay with Roosevelt, to meet him in the White House. Because, of course, Roosevelt, um, have, have being a, who had polio and was confined to a wheelchair, was never able to come to the UK. But Roosevelt did send over um, 
emissaries, and one of them was Harry Hopkins. And he, Churchill, through what you might call dinner diplomacy, uh, he basically, he schmoozed people. He, he brought them into his orbit, and um, he would make them feel that they were the most important people. So he took this uh, emissary of Roosevelt, Harry Hopkins, he took him to Scotland, to, to Glasgow, to, to see the munitions factories and what was being done in the city to um, build up the various industries. And Harry Hopkins was, was so impressed with what he'd seen that he wrote Churchill a letter afterwards and, sa and quoted Ruth. He said, basically, this is what he said. He said, our God will be your God. Whither thou lodgest, we will lodge. And wherever you go, we shall go, even to the end. And Churchill was what you might call a Regency figure, more of a Victorian figure, because Victorians kind of, kind of had a stiff upper lip. But Regency figures uh, were known for their lachrymosity. Churchill, it's recorded about 50 times, would burst into tears. Uh, Churchill describing the persecution of the Jews to Attlee, Attlee reports that he had tears coming down his face. Uh, he was a remarkably emotional man, given that dealing with the uh, unprecedented crisis of having to deal with the Nazis almost on his own for at least a year, with of course the support of his empire, he had to remain calm in the eye of the storm. But he was always uh, an emotional man and he was never, never afraid to show his emotions. So the questions that are asked about Churchill um, obviously are if he was so philo-Semitic, why couldn't he do more to help the Jews in World War II? Um, Churchill maintained in a speech in 1946 that they did, they did know that terrible things were being done to the Jews, the massacres and so on. But I don't, what he said in 1946 was that he didn't really fully comprehend the industrial scale of the extermination camps, which I find a little hard to believe because there was quite a lot of evidence coming out of Poland um, from 1942 onwards of what was going on. And when this was brought to Churchill's attention, he did minute a note to Eden that the RAF should do all that it could to help bomb the railway lines to Auschwitz um, and that whatever measures, whatever it took to try to, to stamp out the extermination should be done. But the problem is, is that Churchill didn't actually deliver on that. And as far as immigration of, of people that were trapped inside Nazi, inside Nazi occupied Europe was concerned, they all wanted, a lot of them wanted to go to Palestine, but the British officials didn't want them to. And even though Churchill overrode his officials, um, he, you know, a lot of Jews simply were turned away. And um, Roosevelt wasn't a lot better because uh, you'll, you'll, you'll know of the story of the SS Louis, um, that um, they, America, for all its vast space, they, they really didn't allow many Jews to immigrate there at all. Because they, as, the, as they often said, the Canadians and all the rest of them, that they don't have a problem of anti-Semitism and they didn't want to create one, which I think is a pretty feeble excuse uh, looking back. But there were some things that Churchill can do, could do. I mean, he, he made it his priority to neutralize Spain. Um, and Spain actually became a bit of a transit country uh, to allow Jews to escape from uh, occupied France to Morocco. Um, it's quite amusing, actually, because one of the ways in which he did neutralize Spain was to bribe its, its generals. Uh, in, in current terms, about 200, 200, $200 million dollars were spent um, in bribing Spanish generals and, and agents to persuade Franco to stay neutral in the war. He was conscious of the uh, terrible plight of the Jews through the war and through his broadcasts uh, he gave great encouragement to people like Anne Frank who, always, who described him in her diary as our beloved Winston Churchill. <laughs> 
So his capacity to inspire hope through his speeches was enormous. He described the Holocaust as being a crime without a name and the most horrible and terrible crime in, ever committed in the whole of history. So he certainly was aware of the enormity of it. In fact, he wrote to the Jewish Chronicle in 1941, none has suffered more cruelly than the Jews. The unspeakable evils wrought on the bodies and spirits by men, by Hitler and his vile regime. The Jew bore the brunt of the Nazis' onslaught on the citadels of freedom and human dignity. He has become and continues to bear a burden that has seemed to be beyond endurance. He has not allowed it to break his spirit. He has never lost the will to resist. Assuredly, in the day of victory, the Jew's sufferings and his part in the struggle will not be forgotten. Once again, at the appointed hour, he will see vindicated those principles of righteousness, which it was the glory of his fathers to proclaim to the world. So if Churchill managed with the help, of course, of the armed forces and his allies to beat back an almost unstoppable enemy, how come he got defeated in the 1945 election? Well, I think this is because although the British electorate revered him, they hated what the Conservatives did in the 1930s in appeasing Hitler, and Churchill was inevitably um, seen to be part of the Conservative Party. Um, of course, the question is, how much different would the history of Palestine and Israel have been uh, had Churchill uh, retained the reins of power in 1945? Um, I think it would have made a lot of difference. I think that Churchill remained somewhat um, inconsistent as in his Zionism. Sometimes it waxed and waned. I mean, his best friend, Lord Moyne, was assassinated by the Stern gang, and Churchill almost threw his Zionist beliefs overboard. But he would have been a lot more, he would have been tons more sympathetic to the Jews than was Clement Attlee and Ernest Bevin. And when Israel was finally created, he would have recognized it a lot sooner than the British. I think it took them a couple of years. In fact, when Churchill became Prime Minister again in 1951, his Zionism became more pronounced. Uh, he, he was always an imperialist, I don't forget, and his, his principles were that uh, whatever, whatever was good for Britain and the British Empire was the most important thing. Well, you would expect him to say that, but uh, certainly as far as Egypt was concerned, uh, Churchill was very happy for Israel to, to give Egypt a good beating because, of course, he wanted to preserve the, the, the Suez Canal. Uh, he did back Eden over Suez, although he said that uh, he would have tried to clear it with Eisenhower first um, because it, Eden made a pretty bad mess of Suez and he had to give up fairly quickly. Uh, but, of course, by the time of Suez, Churchill was, was, had, had lost the reins of power but as the years went by, um, his pronouncements on Israel and his contacts with, um, initially with Weizmann until he died, but with Ben-Gurion, became stronger and stronger um, as time went by. And he did, in, he did um, enjoy the, an enduring respect from the Israeli uh, Labour Party and the, the, governing, the, the governing prime minister and president. And when Churchill died in 1965, his, um, his memorial service, his funeral, took place at St Paul's on a Saturday. And whilst it's probably not de rigueur for a Jew to go to a church at all or a cathedral, um, certainly Ben-Gurion and the president at the time, Zalman Shazar, um, they came over to the Savoy Hotel and they walked to St Paul's. Uh, there was, I, don't, I don't think there was any correspondence in the newspapers about them doing the wrong thing because we're talking about a man who not only saved the Jews as a people but helped to bring about their state as well. So full honour should be paid to him on his death. Uh, 
That's Chaim Weizmann, who he formed a very close bond with, as I've said, starting in the early 1900s um, and then following through to the Balfour Declaration and beyond. That gentleman there is Leon Blum. The thing about Churchill is, is that he could, he, could, he could form friends from all different parties. Leon Blum was a French socialist prime minister, so it wasn't just conservatives that he was friendly with. Now, Hitler said of Churchill that um, he was a fat, lazy drunkard kept afloat on Jewish gold. Well, certainly as far as being fat is concerned, uh, Churchill said of exercise that um, he, act, he often acted as a pallbearer at the funerals of vegetarians, non-smokers, and teetotalers. As far as being a drunkard is concerned, um, it's been said that he couldn't have been an alcoholic because he drank too much to be an alcoholic. Um, but he always said of alcohol that uh, he took more out of alcohol than alcohol took, uh, took out of him. He wasn't lazy, although he had an afternoon lap, and although he, he was often in bed till 12 noon, he would, on the other hand, he would work till three, three or four o'clock in the morning. He was actually a very hard worker. And it, it you know, as I've said before, the six million words that he wrote as a historian exceeded that of Dickens and Shakespeare together. And then kept afloat on Jewish gold. Well, as I said to you, uh, he wasn't paid as an MP in his early years, and uh, his parents hadn't really preserved their wealth. And Churchill was a bit of a gambler himself, but he did earn his keep through his journalism and through his uh, works of history. But he made some bad choices, and there were occasions when, when Jews did help him out. And this is one of his benefactors, Sir Henry Strakosch, that left him a lot of money in his will. Um, other Jewish financiers that he worked with was Bernard Baruch, who was his stockbroker. And there's a picture of him there with Churchill, and another one there. But it would be very wrong to say that, uh, that Churchill somehow was totally dependent upon these people. They did, they did help him, but uh, he did a lot to help himself as well. Um, yes, of course he made use of uh, Jews that had a great deal of knowledge. That's Sisoli Zuckerman, who was a South African scientist. Um, and um, there are many others. I don't know why there's a picture of Stalin there. That's a picture of Churchill by Karsh after he'd taken his cigar away. So that's why he's looking so fierce. A bit more cheerful there. Brexit bulldog. Would Churchill have opposed um, the European Union? Uh, he advocated the United States of Europe, but um, he always felt that Britain should be a part. Uh, and it's often said of Churchill that if he had to choose between Europe and the open sea, he would choose the open sea, i.e. America. Nice thing about Churchill was that he had a puckish sense of humour. That's him with his daughter Mary Soames. And there he is with Ben Gurion. And I think that sort of sums up Churchill's philosophy. When he died, I don't know, some of you might remember the funeral, but the, the jibs of the cranes along the Thames, they dipped in respect to him as the cortege went by in the Thames. And as you can see, the train went through the countryside up to Bladen in Oxfordshire, and everyone would take off their hats, and uh, there were literally hundreds of thousands of people came to see him lying in state. Now, Calvin Coolidge, the president of America, said the business of America is business, so you could say the business of life is business. So I have brought some books with me today, which have been, um, they've got some inserts by Andrew Roberts, the author, and um, yes, if you could buy those books, I'd be very happy to sell them. Um, but in the meantime, before we do that, before we have tea, I do apologize if I've spoken too long, but uh, I'd be happy to take any questions. Right. Yes, this lady. Yeah. Uh, can, can I give you, can I give you my mic? Uh, we could just have your name as well, that would be nice. You don't have to stand up. Norman Frankel, how does your book compare with the books written by Sir Martin Gilbert? Well, yeah, of course, it's not my book. I was just doing a little bit of research and proofreading. Uh, it's Andrew Roberts' book. Every historian owes an enormous debt to Martin Gilbert. <laughs>
He wrote the book, as uh, Spencer pointed out, Churchill and the Jews. He wrote dozens and dozens of books. You know, in fact, when you, when you think about this ridiculous thing that uh, Jeremy Corbyn said recently about the Jews having no sense of irony and no sense of history, I mean, it's so absurd because just think of some of the top historians. Martin Gilbert, Lewis Namia, Simon Sharma. Um, there are just dozens of them. Isaiah Berlin, I mean, Lewis Namia and Isaiah Berlin, they both helped Churchill write his books on Marlborough and the Second World War. Um, you know, history is written into our DNA. I mean, our whole appreciation of, the, of our Bible and all of our literature is, is, is historical. So, yes, Martin Gilbert was a superb historian. Um, and not only did he, did he write the last six volumes of the Churchill biography, but he wrote companion volumes as well. So his research was uh, tremendous. And, uh, yes, Andrew Roberts would acknowledge that every Churchill historian owes a lot to Martin Gilbert. Yes. Uh, my name is Robert Slager. Why didn't Churchill uh, act it bombing the railway lines to the concentration camps? Well, because I, th I think large part of it was because the Americans didn't want to go along with it. Remember that um, it, was it was a long way from London to, to Poland. And even, even though at the time... Uh, after D-Day, that, that obviously the Allies had made inroads into Europe. It wasn't wasn't that easy from the point of view of fuel to get to uh, to get to Auschwitz. And the thing is about Auschwitz is that there were so many different railway lines that were leading to it that if you bombed one railway line, there might have been, you know, a dozen other ones because it was a, it was a central nodal point. Um, but I. I know that there are historians who say that the Allies could have done a lot more, but on the other hand, the, the Allies would say that they were fighting a war to the death which had bled the countries white. Um, you know, Britain was on the verge of bankruptcy at the end of the war, and that their main objective was to fight the war. And unfortunately, there were people at the time who said that this was a war for the Jews. There was an enormous amount of anti-Semitism in Britain at the time. You know, people were having a dig at what they thought were Jewish black marketeers. And if any politician said, stood up and said that, you know, we're doing this to defend the Jews, it would have been very unpopular. And Churchill was unpopular in the Conservative Party because of his ardent Zionism. Uh, you know, his own constituency, where I now live in Woodford and Loughton, Epping, they tried to deselect him over Munich. Uh, I don't think anybody could accuse Churchill of having a want of courage, but sometimes he had to do, he was on his own because he had his ministers that he had to cooperate with, he had the civil servants and the foreign office. So, yes, in, in retrospect, it, 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 one could only wish that the Allies did do more, but I don't think the blame could only be put at the door of Churchill. I think the Americans as well with their much greater economic and military power, have also got a case to answer. Hello, my name is Alan Posner. Can I just fill in a little bit more about this um, questions that you've, we've, been, um, um, we've been dealing with with regards to the bombing of the railways leading to the camps? Yes. Um, from what I understand from history, Churchill did spend, had a plan with the RAF to actually bomb the camps, to bomb bomb the crematoria um, and, and whatever. Um, and unfortunately, the, the RAF did put a lot of obstacles in the way. And um, though the plan was accepted in principle, um, I think a lot of the hierarchy in the RAF um, didn't, didn't want to get involved in this particular, um, this particular part of the war. Well, I mean, I can agree with what, you, with what you've said. He, he did encounter a lot of uh, opposition, whether it was for purely logistical reasons or because, you know, there was so much anti-Semitism around at the time. I, I don't really know what the answer is, but there is a historian based in Israel called Michael Cohen who's written exhaustively on this subject. And uh, if it's something that you wish to explore more, I would recommend you to read his papers on the subject. Any other questions? <clears throat> I guess you can say fill in. Um, it's Golto. Um, first of all, thank you very much, and thanks for sending me the invite. Um, and also, thank you for the people surrounding next to me while I was making all the noise-taking notes. 
Um, in this regard, I'm going to start by saying the shame kid is a shame because we've said lots of um, potentially challenging things in this regard. And I, I wanted to ask in regards to, you said by 1991 and, and by, um, from, from the historian, that he became a certain within his side, his Zionism. Um, in that regard, in regard, you can see potentially, as you've noted, regarding psychoanalysis, that he had relationships potentially with communism and fascism. And he was battling his own level of potentially identity, and which is, uh, as you put it, um, connected to that of the Jew. Um, and that's one of the three sparks from the beginning of time. So uh, in, in, in regards to his relationships, I guess, and I noticed through people's... Uh, I will get to the question in a moment. Sorry. Oh, well. do, you think, do you think it's challenging, potentially, to put such a book and for a Jew to say certain things that it might rationalize by missing out certain information um, and rationalize potential battles of, of hitting train tracks, etc.? Well, when you say missing out information, I mean, this book is a th over a thousand pages long. Um, Andrew Roberts has, has, has mined, this, the lady down here who spoke about Martin Gilbert before, um, there are so many new archives that have become available since Martin Gilbert wrote his uh, magnum opus on Churchill. I mean, Andrew Roberts had access to King George VI's papers, Mary Soames' diaries, the diaries of two Soviet ambassadors. There's an interesting sideline side here, but the ambassador to the UK, the Soviet ambassador to the UK, Ivan Maisky, and the Soviet ambassador to the US, Maxim Lit Litvinov, were both Jews. Um, and Churchill got on very well with both of them. Um, he'd also had uh, access to cabinet uh, minutes. He's, he's had, in fact, I think it was General Ismay who said that no definitive biography of Churchill could be written until at least the year 2010. Um, you know, it's a very deep mind. Churchill lived for 90 years, as I said before. He wrote six million words. You, you could actually spend your life um, researching about Churchill and uh, there's always more to be found and I, I regret that I probably spoke for more than you wanted me to tonight but it's just so difficult to condense a man of his stature he achieved so much in his 90 years into 45 minutes anything else sorry down here no. Thank you for listening to me. <laughs> no, no. Well, Richard, um, thank you for that whistle-stop tour around the life of Churchill. Um, you quoted drink several times. We have a little something for you. Um, Churchill was once quoted as saying, when I was younger, I made it a rule never to take strong drink before lunch. It's now a rule never to do so before breakfast. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's, it's hard to pin down exactly how much Churchill drank. One estimate placed his consumption of Paul Roger champagne at 42,000 bottles during his lifetime. <laughs> Now, you also mentioned when, um, his marriage to uh, Clementine. Mm. Uh, to get an idea of Churchill's annual alcohol consumption, here's what he ordered in 1908, the year he married her. And it's going to take a few seconds to tell you this. Nine dozen bottles and seven dozen half bottles of Paul Roger, 1895 vintage champagne, plus four dozen half bottles of the 1900 Paul Roger's vintage. Six dozen bottles of St. Um, Estef red wine, five dozen bottles of port, seven, do seven dozen bottles of sparkling Moselle white wine, six dozen bottles of whiskey, three dozen bottles of 20-year-old brandy, three dozen bottles of vermouth, and four bottles of gin. So um, he, he did drink um, whiskey, and, oh, right. uh, and because he did that, um, we'd like you to accept on our behalf this rather Thank nice bottle much. of whiskey. Right, that's what I want.